shadows of the past, as from a faded tapestry of time's procession, slow and vast, I step to bid you bear with me, the while your fancy I engage, to look upon another age, an age when on the human tide the plumed wave of chivalry rose to its summit, sweeping wide across a nation's mighty sea. France never shone a brighter power than in this high, romantic hour. So come with me to France of old, to fiery days when hearts beat high, when blood was young and hate was bold, and sword crossed sword to do or die. For love and honor gloried then, and friendship reached its peak with men. Friends were friends in those brave days. Athos, Porthos, Aramis, I graved our hearts with a mystic phrase, bound our lives with a mystic tie. Come, stir your soul with our ringing call of all for one and one for all. Louis XIII, King of France. Maintaining his royal authority through the wits of others, he is himself weak and vain and lives in the oily smiles of a small circle of favorites. But the court is alive with intrigue. There are parties within parties, conspiracies beyond conspiracies, plots and counterplots. Monseigneur the Cardinal, Duc de Richelieu. He is the greatest statesman of the day and manipulates the strings which guide the king. His is the real power, subtle, cunning, and often ruthless. Still, no one questions his devotion to the glorious kingdom of France. On this auspicious morning, the king pays a state visit to his queen. It is the custom for the sovereign and his courtiers to attend the expectant royal mother until his child is born. D'Artagnan of the king's musketeers. Relieved of his duties at court for the day, he hurries to the home of his sweetheart, Constance Bonacieux. Constance is seamstress to the queen and is expected at the palace, so she cannot tarry long. Even the most eager lover by error can sometimes kiss a miss, or miss a kiss. an infant's layette in a crocheted basket for the queen. One kiss, one caress. Thank you. 
kiss truly is a delicate plant requiring privacy to grow into a tender blossom. The dream of all lovers. Cathedral of Notre Dame remind D'Artagnan of his friend and fellow musketeer, Aramis. He might be in danger. Aramis had threatened to continue his flirtations with the pretty owner of a roving, provocative eye, who unfortunately is married to an officer in the Cardinal's Guards. A guardsman naturally resents these attentions from this musketeer, but is restrained. Has not the Cardinal forbidden these duels with the King's Musketeers? Hola! Famous battle cry of the Musketeers. Instant help comes from the most fearsome steel in the kingdom. Huge Porthos. Brave, strong, a King's Musketeer. And Musketeer Athos. Gentle Athos. Yet a deadly swordsman is able to kill with his left hand as with the right. D'Artagnan! The battle is for me. The Cardinal's guards. This is no private fight then, eh? The musketeers against the Cardinal's guard had started before D'Artagnan was born. And what are the odds? One, two, three, four, five, six, ten guards to four, five to two, two and a half to one? <laughs> Too simple. Draw your skewer, Monsieur Half Guardsman. Let's measure half a point. On guard! Where's your challenge now? Where's your steel? What's your fear? The law? Does the Cardinal still ban a friendly fight with a musketeer or two? Killer! Porthos, as always, is thirsty. He has capacity. D'Artagnan, with his quicker eye, has a more bountiful drinking source. Porthos can put out a hand and pick up the pot he's slavers for. Why waste energy walking? Come, driver. Come inside with us. The old driver swears his wagon is damaged. His master will skin him. His horse is loose. He has a terrible wife. He has trouble. Everybody is mean to him. He has to be mean, too. Ha-ha! <laughs> now, take your temper out on me, good friend. Right, now, feel better? Now we can talk. I'll win you the price of your horse and more. Come, guardsman, I challenge you to game. This is not forbidden you. are kind. Here's 20 times your price. Riding high, D'Artagnan returns to the dice game. 
Laughing and playing a while longer, he wins hands down from a fat-headed guardsman while waiting for the late evening rendezvous with Constance. Porthos, too, has women on his mind. the musketeers ever lost in fair fight. Of course, it has to be with a fair sex. For the first time in his life, a panic-stricken Porthos screams a terrified, Hoyla! Athos hears him. Aramis springs bravely to the side of his comrades, and they flee together. But D'Artagnan, he is only the pounding of a lover's heart. As the flood of battle at last sweeps close to him, he leaps to meet the foe. And draws his sword. He will fight. Yes? No. Yes. No, he won't. Here, indeed, discretion is the better part of valor. Caught between the she-devils and the deep blue sea, <laughs> they choose the water. beyond the gates is so great that the people are admitted to the courtyard. Adjoining the Queen's apartment, Constance prepares the layette. She is informed by Father Joseph, the Cardinal's trusted henchman of the imminence of the royal birth. One day to become Louis the Fourteenth. By ancient custom, his royal father presents him to the people. Queen's bedroom, another cry is heard. One of those rare turns of destiny. And Constance is the first to warn the tired, dozing midwife. Joseph grasps the vast consequences of this extraordinary event. This news must be conveyed discreetly to Cardinal Richelieu before it gets abroad. He writes a message inside the wrapper of some medicine, intends it for the Cardinal's eyes alone. Your medicine, Your Eminence. Duke de Rochefort, conniving head of the most powerful faction in court, working always in self-interest against the king and cardinal, pretending loyalty to both.
necessity for caution on the part of Father Joseph is indeed well founded. De Rochefort, having many times seen messages thus taken to his eminence, becomes inquisitive. He resolves by a simple trick to learn the secret passed to the cardinal. A substitution of scraps of paper. realizes that enemies of the regime can do irreparable damage. Two heirs to the throne. Two rival parties of courtiers. More quarrels, more bloodshed. Poor France, helpless, torn between two factions. The secret of the twins must indeed be forever guarded. If France is to have peace, and if he, the cardinal, is to retain his power. Pretender this, a true prince. De Rochefort sees an opportunity. Father Joseph is instructed to prepare for a long voyage. The cardinal has a plan. He sends a page to summon De Rochefort. Constance shares possession of a great secret, one so sacred it might well spell the future of France, the Cardinal charges her to keep her lips sealed. Richelieu entrusts the wily de Rochefort with Constance's safety. She must not be permitted to see anyone until further notice. The Cardinal is not at liberty to tell his reasons, but de Rochefort is making his own plans. In accordance with the Cardinal's command, Father Joseph, accompanied by the midwife, secretly takes the twin away to the Spanish border. The child shall be raised as a commoner with no knowledge of his royal birth. Meanwhile, in the great ballroom, the king holds a reception in honor of his firstborn. Had he known the cradle should have held two sons, he might have been less self-satisfied with the cardinal's congratulations. To the notorious Milady de Winter, de Rochefort comes to reveal this chance of fate. The future of France may be in their hands. He tells her he will turn Constance over to her. She is to escort Constance to the convent of saint Gamel. There, force her to tell the whole of the Cardinal's secret and plans. He will play one against the other, Cardinal against King, for his own ambition. Chair carriers runs with the news to the musketeers' barracks. D'Artagnan, wake up! Constance taken by force! By de Rochefort. To arms, to horse, rescue. All for one and 
one for all and hang the tack. Wily cheat is in no mood to cross steel with this angry Gascon bet on justice. are powerless to help. abduction by Milady de Winter. Cardinal Richelieu and his escort reach the well to confront the Duke. and titles banished from both court and country forever. Fearing for the safety of Constance, the Cardinal speeds in pursuit of Milady de Winter. Before dawn the next morning, the convent of saint Gemel. unsuspecting nuns, her prisoner is an enemy of the state, to be confined to the convent on orders of the cardinal. The banished de Rochefort, smarting under his humiliations, lingers in Paris. All is not lost. He uses the last of his wealth in a desperate gamble and buys the services of ruffians. Find 
find D'Artagnan and his three musketeer friends and put them to the sword. De Rochefort still dreams of himself in terms of the most powerful man in France. The path to power is open if Milady de Winter secures the secret from Constance. Scrupulous Milady de Winter seeks to cajole Constance into telling all she knows. No, Constance Bonacieux is not here. But he hears her voice. Hola. One for all and all for one. D'Artagnan hears Constance whisper that she loves him, loves him above all men. And then she murmurs three words, the other one, the other one. D'Artagnan strains to hear the faint pulse of her words, but Constance dies. The musketeers take Milady de Winter to her punishment. through the night. He hears the dreadful news from the Mother Superior. Constance is dead. murderous Milady de Winter and all in concert with her. The three musketeers, Athos, Porthos and Aramis, enraged, take the law into their own hands and deliver the murderers to the public executioner and order her death. Then de 
those cutthroats close in on the Cardinal's troop. distance away the musketeers are captured by their deadliest rivals. The Cardinal's guard formally arrests the musketeers for continuing to take the law into their own hands. Disarmed, the musketeers are set against the wall for execution. Your guards would take the lives of my friends. Single-handed they shall have revenge. Cardinal asks a moment to ponder. Constance dead. A murderess executed. Enough blood has been shed. Now this strife tricks musketeer and guard shall end. D'Artagnan's plea saves his friends. But there's to be a harsh penalty. Richelieu's plan concerns the state and these continuing disputes between his guard and the king's musketeers. The four musketeers must separate, never to come together again on pain of death. His judgment, oh, a sorry day. The musketeers are banished, each to his own province, never to visit Paris again, nor set foot beyond the bounds of his own fields. For you, D'Artagnan, a splendid soldier, reliable, devoted to. You henceforth shall be bodyguard of the future king, beloved of France, the nation's one. At one fell swoop, all strife is done. The musketeers prepare for their banishment. Godspeed, farewell. friendship, it shall not pall. All for one, and one for all. Five years have passed. France is at peace. The infant prince grows to boyhood. Cardinal Richelieu, driven hard by the responsibilities of high office, lives in semi-retirement. And a royal father educates his son in courtly etiquette. In failing health, his eminence lives in hourly expectation of death. Troubled by word that the second twin bears an identical likeness to the heir. The dangers inherent are obvious and weigh heavily on the Cardinal's mind. He decides he must protect the Prince somehow. His eminence provides that the rightful twin may always be identified from the other. With the aid of the court jeweler, he caused a gold doubloon to be broken. The smaller piece hangs on a chain around the throat of the infant prince. And its mate, he places about the neck of Captain D'Artagnan. And so, by joining the pieces, the true heir to the throne of France and the prince's first guardian are known to one another for all time. He starts to say, I hold a secret. 
but the chill hand is upon him. The life spring ebbs, and the great voice is silenced. A great statesman passes into history. The church loses a noble servant, and the ship of state is without its pilot. What was this secret that Richelieu and Constance shared? The other one. Across the Spanish border, the prince's twin brother is reared by servants of the late cardinal. The banished de Rochefort living nearby holds the twin under his very eye. He bides his time. He has only to wait patiently for the proper day. On the death of Louis XIII, the heir to the throne, or the Dauphin as he was called, became France's King Louis XIV. Both he and his twin had grown to manhood. The brothers are alike as two peas in a pod. Twenty years have passed and more since Richelieu bent his iron will to break the bonds that held us four. But Porthos, Athos, Aramis, I will ride once more. Once more we'll heed the clarion call of all for one and one for all. During the years, de Rochefort's connivings have brought the exiled twin under his control. Secretly, they have returned to Paris. De Rochefort has lavished upon the usurper the trappings of royalty, teaching him to copy even the handwriting of his brother, the king. Yet the quality of the spirit so generous in the king is replaced in the brother by hatred and viciousness. The king's valor to de Rochefort's spy brings long-awaited news. Within the week, an older d'Artagnan, after a lifetime of loyal service, will retire and leave the court. The young king will be without a bodyguard. Every detail of their plan has gone over. The map, the sentries to overpower, the secret approach to the royal apartment, the signals. tells the pretender, you will be His Majesty Louis XIV, King of France. Louis XIV, King of France, spends D'Artagnan's last day in fun and gaiety. The king has applied himself to an education in horsemanship, sportsmanship, and swordsmanship. No two men were ever closer except they were father and son. Tonight he feels happy, his service is done, his king is secure, the state is safe, but by some odd premonition the coins are matched on this final night of parting. evening with the king, 
Captain D'Artagnan arrives outside his lodging and is amazed to find himself beset by ruffians. Angrily, the Gascon plans his battle. First, he deals with the dagger man decoy, sticks in with his own blade, throws the man's cape to the edge of an open sewer, places his own cape over the decoy's body and fires his own pistol. Hey, oh, on to the balcony. A thoughtful D'Artagnan returns to his lodging. For a peaceful man to be waylaid on a city street is something new. Mm. He had spent the evening with his king. He reflects. Has the palace discipline been slackening too? Sentries were not where they should have been. His soldierly heart is disturbed for the safety of his king. De Rochefort's plan is working without a hitch. Sentries at the outer gate have been overpowered. Entry is forced into the inner quadrangle. The palace is entered through a servant's postern leading to long forgotten cellars. Success. No sound, no word, no warning. impatiently below for the deed which will make him king. In the anteroom to the king's bedchamber, de Rochefort's maggot awaits his master's signal, ready for the final treachery. tragic moment, France loses her rightful king. surrounded by strangers, looks unbelievingly at a venomously mirrored likeness of himself. The usurper watches his royal brother with a lifetime of hate. The Rochefort's plans have been cleverly checked and double-checked. He means to hold the true king a prisoner as a threat over the head of the usurper should he rebel against his commands. At de Rochefort's order, his cohorts strip the king of his night attire and in exchange dress him in the usurper's clothes. Into the palace cellars, a messenger reports breathlessly. D'Artagnan is dead, his body thrown in the river. Complete triumph at last. An iron mask. An invention of the devil. An iron mask, a prison within a prison, is placed over the head of the rightful King Louis XIV and locked at the neck. His countenance concealed from all men.
true king is led away. In the quiet of the royal apartments, the true king's bed is occupied by the usurper. Trusted servitors have been spirited away. The twins' lackeys have replaced them. De Rochefort's plan is complete. Poor France. Ruled by a youth driven near to lunacy by a solitary childhood, by De Rochefort's lies, by his own poisoned dreams. Truly a madman. Suffering in human life is proportioned to human strength. When the young king, stupefied and crushed, found himself led a prisoner to a cell in the Chateau Saint Marguerite in the south of France, he fancied at first that death is like sleep and has its dreams. He believed himself to be a spectator, a palpable phantom of his own suffering, a torture the more terrible since it might be eternal. Eternal death. How can I have died? I am a king, yet not a king, enthroned upon a funereal couch. No, no, dear God, do not punish me who have done nothing. Why am I thus punished? Like a cloak, the chill of the dungeon falls upon his shoulders. So dwells the real Louis XIV in the living hell to remain thus the rest of his days. Queen Mother, always restricted, prevented from seeing her son, determines finally to pay him a visit. In place of the affectionate and courtly Louis XIV, to her horror she finds herself repulsed. Doubts, again doubts. What strange malady besets my son? She thinks again of the other one. De Rochefort hurries to the king's apartment, fearful that a mother's heart has sensed the truth. In pretense of humility, he asks the queen mother to leave. Affairs of state. again and whispers death. Day by day, night upon night, the prisoner prays for some way to get word to D'Artagnan. A heaven-sent fisherman hopes too. finishes scratching a message into Pewter, and as all good prayers must be, his prayer is answered. Millet and Mackerel are running, and then a catch, apparently from heaven. The fisherman reads the name of D'Artagnan. The idol of the nation, a written word, a beloved name, an urgent message. He, a patriot, needs no urging. Paris goes about its daily affairs, unaware that its rightful king languishes in prison and the queen mother herself faces death as the humble fisherman hastens to D'Artagnan's home. D'Artagnan stays on in Paris and to his hurt amazement continually finds himself barred from the court. Day by day, week by week, audience with the king has been refused him. The fisherman blurts his weird news. A story hard to believe. A lonely castle which D'Artagnan knows like the palm of his hand. A prisoner in an iron mask behind its bars. But the signature 
an etching of a coin that fits his own exactly. Come, friend, eat and drink. There is business at last for me at the palace. Threading his way through the perfumed route of the court's chattering idlers, D'Artagnan finds himself a stranger in a strange atmosphere. And there is reason, he thinks, for this curious tension. To Rochefort and the king. This cannot be the boy I helped nurture into manhood. This is not the face of my king. Those are not his hands that risked neither parried steel nor engaged a point. What's been happening at court? To Rochefort's back in favor, a disgraced exile once more sporting about the throne room in the king's presence. D'Artagnan is amazed and shocked. But a further shock is in store. A chain and coin is passed to De Rochefort. If he can believe his eyes, in all the years he served the king, they never left his royal person. He overhears a snatch of conversation. The other one. And suddenly he hears the dying voice of Constance. The other one. The other one. What did she mean? A message signed by the royal coin. A king, not a king. And a court alive with known traitors. D'Artagnan smells a rat. But a rat has seen him and gives warning. The palace guards are alerted. And all exits barred. D'Artagnan orders a king's loyal troop to be hurried to meet him at the Chateau Saint Marguerite. Couriers are to be dispatched to his old friends, the three musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. To arms, musketeers! Your king has need of you! One for all, and all for one! The jig is up. D'Artagnan lives and knows. There's pewter plate. Perhaps even now he has reached the prison gate. De Rochefort cannot believe his future lies in a common plate. Quickly he resolves to end all doubts. He decides to ride at the head of his troops to prevent any attempt to free the king. Chateau Saint Marguerite, certain that his comrades will join him. Under cover of the raging storm, he rose to the grotto beneath the castle. Many a time as a young officer, he had patrolled this grotto passage. It led, he knew, to the arsenal. Beyond that, the armory. Then the main hall and staircase to the tower itself. Up there is the man in the iron mask, the writer of the message. D'Artagnan finds the entrance to the arsenal as newly walled.
there to hazard it alone if necessary. The fisherman returns to the opposite bank to await the arrival of help. A few years older, a little more grizzled, the same brave companion as of old, ready and willing for any gambit. There's a job to be done. Forward! Through the racks of gunpowder barrels to the main hall and the tower staircase itself.
linger on that account and thirsty as much for the sight of his companions as for a little drop of blood. as you lived, for love of country, in the service of your king. The fisherman gives warning of the approach of enemies. suspects this attempt on her life. The witch's brew, a subtle poison already responsible for many an agonizing death. Raise your glass, madam. 
drink to your king, to your country and its illustrious people. Come, I give you France. Dare she refuse? It is the edict of her son, the king. The toast, but a warning cry. invention, the Iron Mask, his to the end of his days. As D'Artagnan pours away the poisoned wine, the usurper takes swift, bitter revenge. Tanya knows himself mortally wounded, but allows no sign to mar the happiness of his king. Blood, the weapon of the murderer, with crimson evidence on the blade. Captain D'Artagnan to honor him with the baton of a Marshal of France. But where is the musketeer? The court resounds with the king's commands and his cry to find his friend and mentor. What a man may think when he knows of the approach of death is secret between himself and his maker. Perhaps the gallant musketeer thinks most of his lost love, Constance, and of all the tender, lonely years kept warm by her memory. He dies in hope of faith that she might welcome him, that once again they might be one. How can they die, these bright ones? How may such energy, once released, be prisoned by earth or stone or grave? We die as we lived, say they, with life. And with life, how can there be death? Only remember us. Only open a little book and we shall always be with you. To ride a fine horse or to cross a sharp blade or carouse with a barrel or dally with a maid. Come one, come all. So passed a brave and glorious man in honor. Only think and we live again. We live forever. For with us now as ever, it's one for all and all for one. And thus it was in France of old and fiery days when hearts beat high, when blood was young and hate was bold and sword crossed sword to do or die. For love and honor gloried then when life was life and men were men.